and on behalf of all the faculty, the staff, the students at Stanford University and the Stanford Graduate School of Business, let me say welcome to Stanford and welcome to this fantastic Net Impact Conference. We believe your time here will be both educational and inspirational, and I trust by the time you leave here, you will see it that way as well. Our design committee, as mentioned by Liz, has done a fantastic job, and behind them, literally hundreds of Stanford students, our PMP staff have worked very hard to see that this is indeed an educational and inspirational time for you here this weekend. You know, I'm the dean of a graduate business school, so I'm pretty biased about management students. I think they are pretty exceptional, and they have an extraordinary capacity to make a difference in this world. People go back to school to do graduate degrees for a number of reasons. They feel called to do that. I think they go to medical school. They feel a sense of healing the sick. They go to law school if they want to change the world through advocacy and the rule of law. They might get a PhD in science or technology if they want to change the world through the power of ideas. But they go to a graduate school of management because they see that society today, at this time, has chosen managed organizations as the way things really get done in the world. It's the way we produce and deliver virtually all of the goods and services in this world, public and private. And it's managers who are those groups of people that are responsible for seeing that these managed organizations really perform well and perform effectively. It's a noble calling, every bit as noble as the other professions and professional schools. And it really is what innervates and motivates us in what we do here through our 34-year-old public management program, our six-year-old Center for Social Innovation at the Stanford Business School. Because we think that a social awareness and social accountability for businesses is essential to the creation of long-term shareholder value. And equally, we feel that a management awareness and a management accountability is essential for social purpose organizations to really achieve their critical and important missions. So it's this shared sense of social accountability and management accountability that really bridges the gap between various sectors. And that's why I'm so pleased that the theme you've chosen bridging the gap really does, in fact, embody this concept. And to keynote our entire conference and to get us going this morning, I can think of no better person in terms of bridging the gap and who's brought public and private skill and leadership throughout his life than our keynote speaker. Vice President of the United States of America for eight years, Al Gore, uh, was here at the Stanford Business School about a year and a half ago. Uh, we have a program that brings outstanding speakers we call View from the Top. And uh, Vice President Gore was here. I said at the time to our students that we were changing the name for that particular day because Al was going to talk about the view from the oh so very close to the really top. And I think uh, the sense of humor which he displayed in accepting that says a lot about the character of the man. Uh, all of us, of course, remember that agonizing five or six week period between the 2000 election, the Florida primary, and the way that he handled himself and through that remarkable address to the American people demonstrated uh, his compassion for the country and its future said a lot about his character. You know, Al was literally born to public service. Uh, his father was a famous and highly respected senator from Tennessee. So Al grew up in the District of Columbia. He went to Harvard College, where he got a degree in government. And of course, we know him as a public servant. He had a remarkable 24 years as an elected official in equal three parts, you know, eight years in the House, eight years in the Senate, and eight years as vice president. But in addition to that remarkable public service record, he's done so many other things. He's been a journalist. He's been a teacher, and he continues to be a teacher. 
He's been a best-selling author, and he has an incredible array of some very innovative and interesting business ventures. Currently, he's chairman of something new called Generation Investment Management, which is an exciting new investment management firm that's trying to combine traditional equity research with a focus on social and environmental responsibility and corporate governance. He's also president of Current TV, which is a youth-oriented cable channel that he co-founded with our own Joel Hyatt, who's a member of the Stanford faculty. And of course, he's no stranger to Silicon Valley. He's a board member at Apple Computer. He's been a senior advisor for a number of years at Google. Uh, and he, while you know David Letterman and Jay Leno have had a lot of fun about Al inventing the internet, it really is, well, it's not quite true that he invented the internet, but he uh, probably more than any single individual in public policy during the 90s was responsible for laying that framework and groundwork which really has made the internet and web services possible today. And then, of course, perhaps foremost, we know him as an environmentalist. Um, he's written this book called Earth and the Balance, which has now been translated into 25 languages. The one thing Al and I very much have in common is we're both grandparents, and I think there's something about being a grandparent that gives you the time horizon and the concern about the health of our planet, which really tells you, I think, something about the motivation and drive behind his passion to talk to people about the planet and about environment. When he was here a year and a half ago, he spoke incredibly uh, passionately and strongly about climate change, and it really inspired our students at Stanford to spend a whole year for their public management initiative producing a case study on climate change. And we felt it was so good, so thoughtful, so thorough, that just last month we inserted it in our alumni magazine so that all 26,000 of our alumni could read this very well-produced document. And I think it's that kind of leadership and inspiration that Al has brought to students like ours, and it's why it's so great and appropriate that he would keynote for us this morning. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Al Gore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that warm welcome. I, I want to uh, thank Dean Joss for his very generous and warm uh, introduction and for his leadership because uh, Stanford Business School has just been recognized by the World Resources Institute and the Aspen Institute as the number one business school where the topics that you are gathered to discuss are concerned, and I congratulate Dean Joss and the other leaders of this school for their commitment to these issues. I also want to uh, thank Liz Ma. Uh, who was actually a high school classmate of my oldest daughter, uh, and all the members of the Stanford design team who have truly done a spectacular job in organizing this conference, which is the largest in the history of net impact, and I'm reliably informed, now officially the largest conference ever held at Stanford University. So that's a milestone for your organization. Uh, I am Al Gore. I used to be the next president of the United States of America. I don't think that's funny. But you know, on a personal note, before I get started, just, you know, can you imagine Can you imagine? Just a couple of quick examples. I mean, to begin with, I, I used to, I flew on Air Force Two for eight years. 
Now I have to take off my shoes to get on an airplane. <laughs> One quick specific example. Not long after I left the White House, my wife Tipper and I were driving from our home in Nashville uh, to a small farm we have 50 miles away, driving ourselves. <laughs> I know that sounds like a little thing, but I looked in the rearview mirror and all of a sudden it, ju it just hit me. There was no motorcade back there. You may, you, you may have heard of uh, phantom limb pain. Um, so this was a rented Ford Taurus. Um, we were uh, hungry because it was dinner time, so we got off the interstate highway and started looking for a restaurant. We found a Shoney's restaurant. And uh, it's a low-cost family uh, restaurant chain. And we went in, sat at the booth, and the waitress came over and made a big commotion over Tipper. And <laughs> then she took our order and uh, went to the couple at the booth next to us, and she lowered her voice so much I had to really strain to hear what she was saying. She said, yes, that's former Vice President Al Gore and his wife, Tipper. And the man said, he's come down a long way, hasn't he? <laughs> it was an epiphany. Um, <laughs> but the very next day, continuing a true story, I, I flew to Africa on a Gulf Stream to Nigeria to make a speech in the city of Lagos on energy policy. And I began my speech by telling the story that had happened just the day before in Tennessee. And I told it pretty much the same way that I just told it with you. Tipper and I were driving ourselves to uh, uh, Shoney's low-cost family restaurant chain, it, what the man said. And they laughed. And I made my speech, then went back out to the airport to fly home. And I fell asleep on the plane until in the middle of the night we landed on the Azores Islands out in the Atlantic for refueling. And they opened the door to the plane and I put my head out to get some fresh air. And a man was running toward the plane waving a, a sheet of paper and yelling, call Washington, call Washington. And I thought to myself, here we are in the middle of the night, the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, what in the world could be wrong in Washington? And then I remembered it could be a bunch of things. Uh, but what it turned out to be, what it turned out to be was that one of the wire services had written a story about my speech in Nigeria that had already been printed all over the United States. My staff was very concerned because the story began, um, former Vice President Al Gore announced in Nigeria yesterday, quote, my wife Tipper and I have opened a low-cost family restaurant <laughs> named Shoney's, and we are running it ourselves. Before I could get back to the U.S., the late-night television comedians had already found creative ways to use this story. One of them had me in a big white chef's hat with Tipper yelling, uh, one more with fries. <laughs> Three days later, I got a nice, long, handwritten letter from my friend and partner, Bill Clinton. Congratulations on the new restaurant, Al. <laughs> We like to celebrate each other's successes in life. <laughs> and uh, he, he, speaking of Bill Clinton, I think that he and I did a pretty good job when we were in the White House. And <laughs> thank you. He, we, he uh, visited us at our house in Nashville just uh, two weeks ago. We had a, uh, a good long visit. It's been a while, you know. Um, I was with my uh, 
I, I, was, I was forced to uh, take stock of the passage of these years recently. I was with my partner, Joel Hyatt, and incidentally, Joel, Joel Hyatt, who is uh, my co-founder and uh, current TV, uh, a member of the faculty of Stanford Business School, I have learned more about business uh, and, and the, the, the importance of weaving values into every aspect of business from, from Joel Hyatt. He is just a tremendous partner and a wonderful businessman. But he and I were in a meeting in Los Angeles. We worked through lunch and we're headed out to the airport and we're hungry, so we stopped at a uh, soup and sandwich. You're going to think I spend all my time in these <laughs> low-cost family restaurants, but <laughs> sitting there on a plastic chair in front of a plastic table. And a woman in her 60s came walking by just staring at me. And she disappeared. And a few seconds later, here she came from the opposite direction, just staring. And so I looked up and said, how do you do? And she came right over and said, you know, if you dyed your hair black, you would look just like Al Gore. <laughs> I said, I can't tell you how flattering that is, ma'am. She said, you know, you sound like him, too. I hear that all the time. In any case, um, the other business that I have co-founded is Generation Investment Management. And I want you to know that one of our uh, star uh, members of our team is uh, a young woman named Lila Preston, who comes from Net Impact, London Business School. She's here today. And she came to an address that I made at LBS um, I guess a year ago, and um, then later uh, through the interview process uh, came to work for us, and her husband, Brooks Preston, is a graduate of Stanford Business School, uh, and then worked uh, on environmental issues uh, for the Clinton-Gore White House, and now works for BP, which is one of the leaders on uh, many of these issues. I saw a terrific advertisement on carbon footprints that BP had on television here this morning. Um, and also, uh, Jed Emerson is the first uh, generation foundation fellow who is a part of this larger community. And I think Jed's here uh, somewhere today, and I'm looking forward to, to, uh, to catching up. So I, I feel connected to net impact in, in more ways than one. Uh, I, I do want to sincerely congratulate you for being a part of this organization. It's a movement, really. Uh, and starting, I guess, what, 13, 14 years ago, you have grown steadily in size, uh, and your own impact has increased dramatically. And so the first thing I want to say to you is uh, a word of affirmation that you should feel good about making the kinds of decisions that have resulted in you being here at this conference. I think you're on the right path. It's a difficult path, but it's the right path. And you have chosen to take it at a moment in history when millions of people are searching for a better way to find meaning in their lives, when they routinely encounter a business environment and a marketplace that seems too frequently to clash with what they believe in their personal lives is, is right and good and just. And they know that it shouldn't be that way. And the fact that you are learning how to define the cutting edge of a new integration of the larger values that we all feel so deeply into the market system where most of the wealth is allocated and where most of the important decisions are made every hour of every day that will shape and define our world, you should feel good about being part of this movement. 
I last spoke on this stage when I, I gave um, a slideshow on climate change a year and a half ago. Dean Joss referred to it. I have since seen the primer that you, that uh, the students produce, that you put into the alumni mailing. It's terrific and uh, represents a, a really impressive piece of work. I want to talk for just a moment about climate change, but I want to put it into a larger context. I do believe that global warming or climate change is by all odds the most significant challenge that our civilization faces. But it is, in its essence, a symptom. It's a cause of many changes and challenges, but it is also primarily a symptom of a deeper collision between our civilization as we have currently designed it and the uh, ecological system of the Earth. And it's very hard for people to imagine that we could be having a harsh impact on something as large as the, as the Earth system. That's really a barrier to, uh, to, to an understanding for many, many people. And so you have to start with a recognition of the very basic fact that the relationship between human beings on the one hand and planet Earth on the other hand is a relationship that has been utterly transformed in the last hundred years. The transformation of which I speak began earlier than that, began to pick up speed with the Industrial Revolution, but just in the last hundred years, the population of the Earth has quadrupled. And to put that in context, our species uh, is said to have emerged 160 to 195,000 years ago. I'm always reluctant to get into this. We had a trial in my home state. Um, <laughs> but for purposes of argument, um, um, oh, did you see where Pat Robertson said that little town uh, is going to going to go to hell for believing that evolution uh, is actually real. Did you see that? Yeah, they they voted out these school board members who were uh, trying to eliminate science from the textbooks, and 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 he um, he said that the town should gird itself for disasters that may soon be uh, visited upon them. Moving right along, um, <laughs> for purposes of argument, let's say the scientists are right and that we emerged uh, 160 to 190,000 years ago. It took, and, it took most of that time uh, up until the current era, uh, the time of Julius Caesar, Jesus Christ, to reach a population of a quarter of a billion people. And by the time of uh, Christopher Columbus's voyage, we reached a half a billion. By the time America was founded, we reached one billion. By the time my generation was born at the end of World War II, we had reached two billion. In my lifetime, it's gone from two billion to almost six and a half. And my generation will see it go above nine billion. So if it takes more than 10,000 generations to reach two, and then in one lifetime we go from two to nine, that's what the economists call a discontinuity. The recent tracking is very different from what has come before. And the same discontinuity can be measured where the power of technology is concerned. In fact, the transformation is even greater there. So that the average impact of human beings on the Earth has been magnified thousands of times over. And then that average impact, in turn, 
must be multiplied by six and a half billion now. And the most, now to the other side of the equation, the planet system, the most vulnerable part is the atmosphere because it's the smallest, thinnest part. My friend, the late Carl Sagan, used to say that if you had a large globe with a coat of varnish, the thickness of that varnish relative to the globe is roughly equivalent to the thickness of the atmosphere related to uh, the Earth itself. And we're now capable of changing the composition of that atmosphere. And the, the makeup of all the molecules in the atmosphere actually has a powerful leveraging effect on the relationship between the Earth and the Sun. Because the outgoing infrared radiation uh, doesn't all go out anymore. And some of it's always been trapped, which is a good thing, that's a natural process, but the fraction trapped has been increasing dramatically because of our activity in changing the atmosphere. You know all this. But my point is, it is a symptom of that deeper collision between the collective activities of humankind and the planet itself. Look at the other symptoms. Ocean fisheries are being utterly devastated. Fishing with these little nets is one thing. Drift nets 40 miles long with uh, radar-based fish finders, sonar-based fish finders, uh, and these massive fleets just vacuuming the oceans, it's a finite resource. We're not managing it well. In fact, we're really in the process of destroying it. We have to change that. Look at the background. The, the extinction rate is now a 1,000 times greater than the background rate of extinction. There have been five mass extinction events going back 440 million years. This is the sixth, some of the scientists say. Instead of an, a, a, an asteroid hitting the Earth, we're hitting the Earth. The hole in the stratospheric ozone layer is another symptom, although that's a positive case of where we have recognized the collision, taken collective action to to, to, to change it. Disappearance of the tropical forests, and the list uh, goes on. But if all of these symptoms point toward a common cause, that is, the violent and destructive collision between our civilization and the Earth system, what is the solution? Well, the solution lies in the relationship. Healing is often in, found in relationships. And we have to change the way we relate to the Earth. So how do we do that? We do it in our personal lives. You do it in your decision to take this path that's led you here. We do it in our role as citizens, uh, in asking for sane and rational political policies unlike the ones we have now, for example. Um, but by far the largest number of decisions that have an impact on this relationship come in the marketplace. There is one prevailing philosophy that now reigns supreme as the pattern for organizing human societies. And it is um, described by a compound label, democratic capitalism. Democratic capitalism. A philosophy born out of the Enlightenment, much deeper roots, but a philosophy that says in our political decision-making processes we should trust the good judgment of free individuals who are well informed and in our economic decisions we should trust in the power of the marketplace 
and Adam Smith's uh, legendary invisible hand to sort out supply and demand, etc. And the combination is now, now reigns supreme. And we generally believe that's a good thing. And particularly after the long 70-year struggle with the chief competitor, communism, when communism collapsed of its own uh, absurdities, then democratic capitalism became ubiquitous, at least in theory. But let me draw an analogy for you. In the military world, NATO was formed after World War II to fight communism uh, and to, hold, to deter a Soviet uh, invasion of Western Europe and to contain the spread of communism. When communism collapsed, the internal contradictions that had always been present in NATO became more visible. Tensions between the United States and Europe began to rise. Questions emerged about the fundamental purpose of NATO. The enemy's not there anymore. What is NATO doing now? Well, those questions were, were answered creatively and well in the main. But my point is that the disappearance of NATO's competitor led to an identity crisis and a reexamination of internal contradictions that had been invisible for the most part. Philosophically, here's the second half of the analogy, democratic capitalism had a relatively smooth relationship between the two primary spheres that make up the philosophy. But the internal contradictions have always been present. When the competing philosophy disappeared, all of a sudden, some of those internal frictions began to become more visible. And in particular, some of those whose primary roots were in the, the, the market space looked at their long partners whose primary roots were in the democracy space. And the, this, the first group, who I will call market fundamentalists, in the absence of the long struggle and the enemy image, said, wait a minute, a lot of those decisions that have been placed over in the democracy space, we think that we ought to pull those into the market too. Govern government, after all, is really a bad thing. Some believe that. Sometimes it is. But properly, properly run self-government has a noble purpose. In any case, questions like the environment, social responsibility, health care, pensions, things that are related more to the human life cycle and not solely just a matter of supply and demand, have been dealt with more in our democratic processes than purely in the marketplace. It is undeniably true that the discipline of the market, the rigors uh, of the market, have very precise ways to allocate resources and drive decisions, and we should take advantage of that. But the market fundamentalism that has denigrated our ability as free citizens 
to make decisions together about the deepest values that we hold, we need to reaffirm that we have the right to assert values even if a supply and demand equation as interpreted by someone who's looking very narrowly at a row of numbers says that's not efficient as they define efficiency. And the, the divergence between these two spheres is unhealthy. Bringing them back into a closer integration on new, healthier terms is what I think net impact is all about. But I want, I want to define your goals and your mission in that larger context because the entire world is now wrestling with these questions. I was in Germany last week and the deadlock in the negotiations over a grand coalition to form a government there is based on the, the boundary line between democracy and capitalism. The decisions being made uh, in emerging democracies the world over have to do with the same boundary. I have been working in uh, the investment business and with my uh, co-founder David Blood of Generation Investment Management. Incidentally, we wanted to name the company Blood and Gore, but <laughs> the other partners, Peter Knight, for example, uh, objected. Uh, that's how we ended up as Generation Investment Management. But we, we studied how this has been approached in the past. Uh, there have been three waves of integrative efforts. The first 40 years ago, the so-called ethical investing companies used what became labeled a negative screen. If your values say don't participate in selling tobacco or gambling firms, or, the list varies according to the investor. But that became a leading strategy. The, the fiduciaries and the market generally decided that if you eliminate whole sectors of the economy from your potential investments, you're going to spread your risk over a narrower base. And since the normal distribution of risks and opportunities covers the entire space, mathematically, you are likely to be penalized on your return over time. Now, there are people who passionately argue that's not the case, and I, I take no position on that, but the market does. And as a result, that approach to investing has been confined to a 1% niche. So the 99% continues to allocate investment and wealth without regard to the influence of that small sector. A second wave came along designed explicitly to remedy the perceived problems of that first wave. They said, okay, we'll keep everything in consideration. We won't make that mistake and get penalized on the map. But when we allocate to one of these areas that many people are concerned about, we'll do deep research and find the best, most responsible company or companies in that sector and we'll allocate to them. And that satisfied some investors, but again, over time, the market reached a tentative judgment. It's still in process. But the perceived problem was, in practical terms, trying to research every company in every sector every year on traditional and non-traditional factors, ends up producing a reliance on mechanical questionnaires with the same questions, no matter if it's an insurance company or a coal mining company and the results appeared to some to be an inch deep and a mile wide. And many of the portfolios began to seem indistinguishable 
from those constructed without regard to sustainability. The approach that I have spent the last few years with my partners uh, innovating is to integrate sustainability research with traditional equity analysis. And I'm not going to take the time here to describe chapter and verse, but it has been one of the most exciting and intellectually challenging experiences I've ever had. And for the team members who actually pick the stocks and are in the trenches, they routinely say, by far the most exciting work experience that they have ever had. Whether they come from the background of sustainability research, as one third of our team does, or from traditional market analysis, as two thirds of our team does. The sustainability researchers, some of them from the foundation world, some of them from other kinds of NGOs, th they say, hey, this market discipline is really cool. It's so powerful. It gives us uh, a, a, a far more precise and effective way to quantify some concepts that we have in the past dealt with in a more general way. And the traditional equity analysts say, these are the kinds of questions, the ones we're asking now, that we should have been asking all along. One of Lila Preston's classmates uh, at LBS stood up when I gave my slideshow there a, a year ago and said, hey, what's the deal? We just had, she, th this person had just come from a, from a class where they studied one of the HBS cases on Boeing. Anybody here studied that case? All right. They went through the whole case. Nowhere was there any consideration of the environment. And yet, if a large company is going to design and build an entire fleet of global airliners in a world that is imminently going to constrain carbon emissions, there are business implications for being blind to that dimension of reality. Here's a metaphor. Think of the electromagnetic spectrum. We've all seen these charts. Ultraviolet, infrared, microwave, everything along the way. What portion of that long spectrum is made up of visible light? Very tiny slice. But that's the slice of that spectrum that occupies our consciousness every waking hour of every day, and so we naturally assume that's all there is. Or we don't assume that. We assume that we're safe in concentrating almost exclusively on that part of the spectrum. In the White House, every day starts with intelligence uh, uh, briefings. Uh, they used to have integrity. Um, the the um, that was a cheap shot, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> and incidentally, the men and women in the intelligence community uh, r really do, but I digress. Um, routinely, those reports have infrared imagery, ultraviolet imagery, signals collection, all integrated into a larger, robust, more robust picture. Okay, here's the second half of that analogy. If the only, if you look primarily at the financial reports produced by a company in response to the regulatory demands, you will get a very robust stream of numbers that give you a vivid picture of many aspects of that company. And since most everybody is looking at that same part of the spectrum, it's more than enough to occupy every waking minute of analysis. And it can begin to seem like that's all there is. 
But outside the boundaries of those constructed reports is an entire spectrum of value that has to be understood and interpreted in different ways, but does have direct relevance to the way you predict that company's performance over time. One of the great theorists of value came out of the uh, discipline of psychology. Abraham Maslow is best known for his hierarchy of values, but he's also the um, originator of this little throwaway aphorism that I'm sure you've all heard. If the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem begins to look like a nail. If the only tool you use is a price tag, then those things that don't come with price tags attached can begin to seem as if they have no value. Heisenberg, who uh, taught the world that the act of observation can and does actively change the object being observed. We now have so many numbers available to us, we can observe minute changes minute by minute in the value of this, that, or the other. This is not confined to the marketplace. When I entered politics in 1976, I did not take a poll in my first race. By the time I left politics, I'm a recovering politician, incidentally. I'm on, I'm on about step nine. But the, the, when, when I left, hourly tracking polls were common. The act of observing does change the process and the relationship between the observer and the observed. And politics has changed, partly in response to that. The market has changed. The investment process has changed. 30 years ago, the average stock holding period was seven years in the United States. Now the average mutual fund turns over 100% of its portfolio every 11 months. That is functionally insane. And, and let me describe exactly why I say that. Corporate Finance 101 teaches you that 70 to 80 percent of the value of a company builds up over time, a business cycle or longer. If you are investing money and taking it out again in a period of a few months, that's not really investing. You can use the word, but it's really speculating. And because the number streams are so robust, there is a quasi-hypnotic effect, and the entire market is now involved in this churn, and it has horrible consequences for the decisions that have to be made by corporate managers. The quarterly report mentality has been decried for a long time. But those managers who understand why it is terribly wrong face pressure from their largest institutional investors to make sure that they hit that next quarterly projection. The values that lie outside this narrow slice and include our communities, our families, our environment, the quality of our lives, the things that are most important to most of us, get excluded if the time frame is so impossibly short and if the focus is so impossibly narrow. So finding ways to integrate the rest of the value spectrum into 
market-based decisions is one of the most critical challenges facing our entire society, our entire world. And since we are in this unusual time where the world thinks it has decided upon democratic capitalism, but the way the decisions are structured provide these massive distortions that are a principal factor in driving this collision between our civilization and our planet, what you're doing is really significant. Finding a new pathway that does integrate these values. You know, um, when in the Old West, there was so much chaos and violence and um, in Texas they had these, you know, the Rangers, not the baseball team now, I'm talking about the legendary uh, single law person who would go to the area where there was everything going on. Um, I remember in Mark Twain's autobiography he went to Silver City, Nevada as a young man and he said uh, it was quite a place. There was uh, there were gunshots uh, at all hours. There were houses of prostitution on every corner, public drunkenness, gambling everywhere. It was no place for a Presbyterian, and I did not long remain one. Um, <laughs> but this, th this law enforcement organization, which relied on individuals going out to sc scenes like that, developed a code. Here's one of the principles of, the, of that Ranger code. Right is still right, even if nobody's doing it. Wrong is still wrong, even if everybody's doing it. If everybody is making market decisions as if the next 90 days uh, is going to be the end of all the calculations, that doesn't make it right. If all the incentive structures drive to the exclusion of the things that are most important to us in life, it, that's still wrong. You have a chance to change that. I want to close by challenging you to make a personal commitment. Regardless of where you end up, whether it is in a for-profit company that is committed to these issues, a for-profit company that just doesn't get it, whether you go to work for an NGO, a foundation, a community organization, and you try to bring the market discipline into play, wherever you end up, you will, on, from, start, from the starting day onward, confront your own version of this collision. Because the old culture that must be replaced fights back. It asserts itself constantly. And in, and in situations where your personal relationships seem to be at stake, where your career path seems to be on the line, remember that right is right even if the people you're working with are not doing it, and wrong is wrong even if everybody's doing it. And remember what you have learned in this organization and from your peers, that these values have to be integrated. It is not too extreme to say our survival depends upon it. And so when you face that challenge, Choose the hard right over the easy wrong. It will get easier, but you have to be strong, and you have to take the commitments that are so strong now as you are here, protect them, cherish them, take them with you, breathe life into them, and indeed be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to do some Q&A. Thank you so much. I really I appreciate that so much. Um, yes. Hello. Thank you so much for your remarks. I wanted to ask, um, it appears to me that there are many, many really important trends that people are not aware of, two of which I'd like to ask you to comment. It appears that the issue of transparency, our ability to see inside corporations and governments in a way that was not possible in the past, and its companion are maturing um, institutions of accountability are on the rise. How do you see the uh, what, impact? What's the second one? The uh, maturation of organizations of accountability, yeah. like war crimes tribunals and, and our justice systems. How do you see the impact of those two uh, in terms of the kinds of things we would all like to see change on the planet? Well, transparency must be um, a, a given. You, and and you, you have to, uh, to fight for it, insist upon it. Um, there's so many examples of uh, problems that can uh, kill you if you don't have a transparent view of what is really going on. So that's just basic. Um, think about uh, Shell. I actually I, I, I like Shell, but and, and where the environment is concerned, along with BP, they've been one of the the, the leaders. But if you were inv an investor a few years ago and you looked at uh, the transparency of that company, you would have seen an impenetrable uh, structure with two separate boards and uh, a kind of a shell game and you couldn't see where the numbers were actually going. And so even though they talked a great game and actually made some good decisions, the transparency wasn't there. Soon thereafter, all of a sudden they're misstating reserves. Uh, then you look within the structure and behind that non-transparent screen, you see a lot of stuff that would have been taken care of if if only for the, if the transparency had been there. Now the second part of your question is more difficult for me to deal with in a, in a brief response, but uh, yeah, we need to accelerate the maturation of um, processes and forums within which uh, accountability can be placed. The whole enhanced analytics initiative is one of many new efforts underway now to get more accountability and more transparency for the activities and decisions that are made outside the financial reporting streams so that we get a lot more information. Does that res respond to it? Does it bring me hope? <laughs> yes, it does. It does. I was thinking back to an, a town hall meeting I had as a young congressman and, and I laid out some, you know, and, and a woman stood up and said, well, Congressman, what I want to know, is there any hope? And, uh, and I was younger then, uh, and I, I, I ineptly tried humor by saying, no, ma'am, there's not. <laughs> and it wasn't funny at all. So, you know, the answer to that question for me is always going to be yes, uh, but I do happen to believe that, uh, that, that, that that is the right answer. I think that we're moving in the right direction, I do, but this, this is a period of unbelievable transition and transformation in multiple spheres, 
And the way we communicate and the way we make decisions in what could be called the public forum or the public sphere has itself been undergoing a process of big change. We have to reassert the integrity of the, of the public sphere. I mean, the United States, for example, has been making a string of really bad decisions in, in, in the public sphere. How could it be that on the eve of the Iraq war, according to the public opinion poll, 77% of the American people genuinely believed that Saddam Hussein was the, personal respons was the person responsible for crashing the planes into the, the buildings? Uh, he, he wasn't, by the way, in case... Uh, because something like 37% still believe that. Nobody here, I know that. But, but seriously, if, if the public sphere produces mass delusions, then the questions of transparency and accountability are important but secondary to an effort to fix the operations of our marketplace of ideas. Now, I'm not going to, I won't dwell on that now, but I've got a lot to say about that. I think that we, we really need to attend to that, and I think the internet is a, a wonderful tool for helping to bring about that change, but by itself it's not enough. In order to have hope, you have to fix this aggressively. Uh, Mr. Gore, thank you for being here. Um, my question deals with you talking about the divide between government and the marketplace. Um, I think they're divided partly because of the way each works. Government is inherently slow and stable, and the market is allowed to operate um, you know, of its own will and quickly. And so my question is, how do you bring them together to incorporate the values that you say we can't put a dollar sign on um, without slowing down the market to where nothing gets done or without making the government unstable and causing problems? Hmm. <laughs> where to begin? Um, first of all, I'm not drawing a dichotomy so much between the market and, and government as I am between the values that are primarily rooted uh, in the market and the values that have traditionally been rooted in our devotion to uh, democracy and the idea that as free people we can make decisions together about uh, things that are important to us. Government is, has been, one of the primary chosen instruments by which we make decisions that will not necessarily produce the results that would just emerge uh, out of the market by itself. Now, you um, postulated a, a view of the market as uh, incredibly efficient and speedy, and uh, you imply that the prime value in examining that relationship is to, at, in, by all means, stay out of the way and, and, and let it go. I may be misinterpreting, but that's the, the sense of, that I got. If, if we can see that the patterns emerging in the market include an obsessive focus on short-term horizons in ways that completely exclude factors that are important not only because we might believe they're important, but also important to the performance of that business over a period longer than 90 days, then it's just common sense to say, wait a minute, we need to fix this. 
Some of you may know of the studies of corporate managers here in the U.S. What was it, Kinsey? That, that uh, asked a series of hypothetical questions. One of them was roughly this. As a manager, you're presented with a decision to invest in an environmental project in your company that will meet all your standards for return on capital, it's profitable for the company, uh, it'll have reputational benefits also, it's good for the environment, it's something that you really ought to do for all these reasons, but the expenditure that's made now will not reap all of these benefits until a year or two have passed. And in the intervening period, specifically the next quarter, it will incur, it will ca cause a risk that you will slightly miss your current projection for earnings in the next quarter. Will you make that investment? 80% said no. That's irrational. And if, if your ingoing presumption is, hey, under no circumstances get in the way of the way this market is operating, then you have to say, okay, that's, that's okay. We're going let to that, let that go. I don't think we can anymore. So we're facing this large collision. I'm not saying the solution is some heavy-handed government mandate. You have to examine the problems with the proposed solution but don't give up on changing it. It has to be changed. I don't know where to go next. Yeah. Hi. Um, I am really thankful to be here, and I think a lot of us are thankful to be here today. Um, it's a privilege to stop what we're doing and attend a conference like this and think about these things. And it seems to me that, that stopping and thinking like this and considering these different issues is sort of a prerequisite to running businesses and um, economies more efficiently and responsibly and sustainably. My background is in microfinance, and I every day think is about... Is it microfinance? Microfinance, mm -hmm. yeah, in East Africa. And I think every day about the folks that are working so hard, and most of the world, that are working so hard to survive day to day. And I need help thinking about how to talk to, you know, Joe, the subsistence farmer in Uganda, about, you know, not using this fertilizer if he it's the only one available and he can afford it, but it might not be good for the environment, but the how good his crop does, you know, will depend will um, mean whether his family eats or not. I don't know how to think about these things in that context and I really want help doing that. Mm -hmm. um, well the good news is there's a lot of, of help that uh, is available to you. And um, I, bet, I bet there are a lot of people here who could point you right to sources of information and mentors and people who can give you advice on that specific question. And uh, I, I don't know how to connect you, but... I guess I, mean, I guess I mean for you, what do you think is, say, the United States' role in... Um, doing development in a way that's sustainable, but, sustainable and, yeah. but also being quick to respond to the needs of okay, people Okay, I, I, I think that government's role in this moment of transition and, and change should be to uh, define a, a large long-term vision that is global in, in its scope and inclusive in its uh, application to lift uh, the billions who are in uh, horrible poverty and allow them to be participants in the market, but to insist that the market operate in ways that do not systematically exclude and ignore the values that are now at risk, including the environment. Uh, at, the, at the end of World War II, the, the the, the victory of the um, Allies in both the Europe and the Pacific produced a moment. You talked about how it's great to be here and have a chance to pause and think about these issues. In a larger sense, 
the, the moment after the end of the war was like that for the leaders of America. And the Marshall Plan came out of that moment. NATO came out of that moment. Uh, most of the world uh, financial institutions. A and the most important commitment that was made then was to say, we're going to set a long-term goal. One of them, uh, one of the victorious generals who became uh, Secretary of State, George Marshall, said, oh, I'm sorry, it was uh, Omar Bradley. Omar Bradley said, it is time that we steered by the stars and not by the lights of each passing ship. And 50 years later, Europe has integrated. We've had a long period in the main of uninterrupted peace in, in Europe, uh, prosperity, all kinds of problems, but having that long-term stabilizing goal was really important. Here we are now. And 15 years, 16 years after the collapse of communism, there's still no defining goal. We need a global Marshall Plan that will have the uh, saving of the global environment and the habitability of the planet for people as its organizing principle. But it should be pursued and applied in a way that empowers these billions that need market tools to, to be able to participate in a rational way. Right, yeah, right here. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here. My question is about, it goes back to this question of business and government and their interface. Yeah. And um, we've talked about sustainability and about corporations starting to take more, more ownership of long-term values, but it's a gradual process. And there seems to be a disconnect between the trend that's happening in the headquarters and in the operations versus what goes on in Washington uh, in terms of corporate influence and what both the means and, and the ends of that lobbying operation. Um, so can you talk about any opportunities, whether in context of climate change and that issue uh, or other issues of sustainability, where corporations can begin to take a more responsible position? Uh, it's conceivable that they could lobby on behalf of a global Marshall Plan, or on behalf of the Kyoto Treaty, the way that BP did, for example. So can GE, can Ford, Toyota, Google, can they start to look at these as part of their platforms for their public policy positions? I think that leadership in uh, the ex executive uh, boardrooms of major corporations can make an enormous amount of difference. And I think uh, some of the examples you cited illustrate that. Uh, General Electric has undergone uh, uh, a fairly significant change in its direction and focus. I met with Jeffrey uh, Immelt at length on, uh, on, on this point, and members of our firm have dealt with people at various levels of GE to gauge how deeply these new values penetrate. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, it's a sincere, meaningful, pervasive, long-term commitment on the part of the company. Are there shortcomings? I'm sure there are, but it's an impressive direction that is having a big impact. Synergy would be another example of a large company that's had a, uh, a big ship. Um, I'll give you uh, Nestle. When I was... Uh, a young congressman, my wife, had bumper stickers on our station wagon, Boycott Nestle. Uh, and most of you are too young to remember the baby formula scandal in the third world. And it got a terrible image. They systematically changed and corrected every single policy that was going wrong and now are one of the real leaders in almost every one of the dimensions that you study here. Uh, and that, that's, that puts pressure on the rest of their market sector. So, yeah, but it's important that both government decisions and corporate policies move in this direction. Otherwise, those who take shortcuts will not be penalized and instead will be rewarded in the market. Let me, uh, 
let me take just one more, and then, uh, and then we'll have to close. And you, you tell me, uh, right, well, here, she's had her hand. Can I ask a question? Okay, uh, fine. No. I haven't <laughs> figured out thanks, this system. Thanks for, for your presentation. And one issue that I think is really a crux of the environmental problem worldwide is overpopulation. And so I'm wondering, especially knowing that you have four children of your own, what is it that you do <laughs> in your personal and professional life to find well, I'm already problem? behind the curve, uh, the way you... <laughs> <laughs> or what do you think the government should do to address that issue? Um, well, first of all, a population is really an example of a of a success story globally it's hard to 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 uh, recognize it as such but the so-called demographic transition from a pattern characterized by high birth rates and high death rates it's an s curve many of you know this the transition down to low birth rates and low death rates that transition the, the demographers know takes place when several conditions are present. The education and empowerment of women to take part in the decisions of their communities and their society. That has to be present. The uh, survival of children is a leading indicator because in most countries where there is nothing like a social security system, if there's a high death rate for children, lots of children are preferred to make sure that some of them survive to take care of the older people. Uh, the availability of, of uh, culturally appropriate and effective uh, birth control. Um, there are other fa the education of of girls. These, these four conditions, if all of them are present, then this transition occurs. Now, the, the success story is that globally this transition has occurred far more rapidly than anyone would have expected even 50 years ago. There are still outliers. Uh, one of the highest population growth rates is in Saudi Arabia, for example. There, there are uh, uh, but in the main, it is a, a success story. So much so that when you talk about the population problem in Western Europe, you have people saying, oh, yes, yeah, our population is growing way too slowly. <laughs> because in the, in the developed countries that were early into the S-curve, they now have uh, a replacement issue. And part of the problem, uh, I shouldn't get into the problems in, in uh, the Paris suburbs, but you look at Western Europe and, and the um, developing world, there is a, a population decline in Western Europe and Japan, and 95% of the, of the ongoing growth, which is momentum growth in the main, even though the transition has occurred more quickly, the base has increased, the momentum continues, that's an explosion filling a vacuum. And they haven't handled the integration well, and that's maybe the biggest part of it. But the point is, this is a success story that we need to build upon, and, and um, we also need to uh, address the, the other aspects of it. Now, l let me just close by saying this. Back to your question, is there hope? When you talk about all these challenges and you look at the, the, the problems that we confront, there are a lot of people who go straight from denial to despair without pausing on the intermediate step of actually figuring out how to solve these problems. I want to close by affirming to you, and I know this, we have everything we need. There are lots of people who have preceded you in thinking about these things, who've done great work and have prepared repositories of knowledge and advice that you can call upon. You yourselves are creating new knowledge and new pathways. We have the technologies, we have the ideas.
there's only one thing that's possibly missing from the equation, and that is political will. But in a democracy, political will is a renewable resource. Thank you.